It is good to see everybody today. Glad that you could be here. I wonder if you would join with me in a word of prayer, please. Holy Father, we are so thankful to be here this morning and to see the joy of the holiday season as we uh, are during that period of time of thanksgiving and joyous celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior. We thank you that we can share together uh, a spirit of gratitude and a spirit of wondrous celebration. Thank you for making all of this possible. And even now, as we enter into a period of worship, we praise you for being our God. We praise you for loving us, for making everything we need abundantly available, especially that we can assemble together this morning with brothers and sisters who love each other, who love you, and are fully committed to being the kind of people you've called us to be. May we grow into our salvation more and more every day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Just a few things to share with you this morning that uh, you know about, but we want to give you a reminder of them. First is today at 515, the youth group is going to be leaving here at this building at 515 to go to Southland Baptist Church for their presentation of the story of Jesus at, uh, that they call the gift. I don't know how many years they've been doing this, but many, many years. And uh, if you're going to plan to be present, that would be a wonderful thing. Leave at 515 and return when that is over. I can't throw out a time. I don't think anybody could, but as a wild guess, probably be back here by uh, 8 o'clock, maybe earlier. And, uh, and the leaders of our youth group want the whole church to know that everyone is invited. I think you reserved some seating for, uh, for 40 people. So there's room for a lot of us, 40 of us, and probably room even beyond that. Okay. So uh, leave here at 515 and ride together just the seven or eight miles over to Southland Baptist Church. And then uh, next Sunday is Harvest Sunday. On that date, there you are invited to bring food items that will be used to distribute to 30 families in this community who would need assistance through the holiday season. There is a list in the church bulletin of things that you might bring for that. Uh, Brian announced quite well last week that one of our concerns for providing these food items is that there is a lot of poverty in our region um, in something that you and I probably don't know. I, I did this several years ago, and I'm sure the statistics now are the same or maybe even more. There was a whole 25% of the population within a five-mile radius of this building that lives in abject poverty. 25% in every direction. That is north up into Livingston County. That's south to the Graves County line. That's east to Possum Trot. And that's west past McDonald's and uh, uh, Dairy Queen. In that five-mile radius, a lot of children are in need. So this gives us an opportunity to provide for 30 families. On Sunday, December the 25th, there will be no Sunday school classes because of Christmas Day. And we will assemble at 10 o'clock that morning. And you're certainly encouraged to be back at that time. Today, Brian is preaching uh, to us and for us. And we are fortunate to have him in the role that he will be filling uh, completely, effective January 1. I enjoy listening to Brian preach. I enjoy the way that he approaches a text or a theme. Um, he does it differently from, from the way that I do it and in many ways much better than what I do because he just looks at things differently than I do from angle 
that brings in his interest and his expertise. And I think that what we're going to be seeing from him in years to come is a perspective that will be fresh and exciting to us if we come with a heart to hear and ears that want to learn more about the direction God is calling us to live. So, Brian, thank you for your work and thank you for what you'll be sharing with us today. Okay, we are ready to proceed further in our worship, which will be uh, Kid Power. Michelle McKee is leading us in Kid Power. There's Michelle. She's wired up. All of our children who participate in Kid Power, make your way to the front of the building. passing out something this morning, and I'm going to ask you in just a minute to, to tell me what it is. What is it? Band-Aid. A, a Band-Aid. You're right. What, what does a Band-Aid do? It helps your bleeding to stop. Okay. What else? And, 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 and the germ to, 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 to not go in. Yeah, keeps the germs away. What else does a Band-Aid do? <laughs> it helps you don't get affected of the dirt in your bleeding. Right, helps you not get infected. I heard somebody over here. What else? It helps you feel better. Helps you feel better. That's right. So, so how is a how is a band aid like Jesus? How is a band aid like Jesus? Jesus help and that help us. That's really good. Jesus helps and a band aid helps you. Anybody else? When Jesus died on the cross, bandages um, helped his bleeding to stop. Wow, that's really good. When Jesus died on the cross, the bandages helped his bleeding. Okay. Anybody else? How is the Band-Aid like Jesus? Well, I've got a different question for you. How is, it, how is the Band-Aid different from Jesus? Jesus is a person and this is a ding. Right. Well, that's good. That's a good point. It's very literal, yes. What else? How is the Band-Aid different than Jesus? The, the, the Band-Aid is a Band-Aid is, and Jesus is a human. <laughs> That's really good. A Band-Aid is a Band-Aid, and Jesus is a human, right? And Jesus and a Band-Aid both heal, right? But a Band-Aid only covers a little bit, and Jesus covers everything. And how long does it take something to heal with the band-aid how long does it take something a long time a pretty long time how long does it take something to heal when jesus heals it two seconds two seconds maybe not even that long just immediately right well i've got a story i want to read to you real quick about jesus how he heals so quickly So this is a story about how Jesus healed 10 lepers.
share his story. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my paper fell out here. I know how you feel, Carol, when you like lose your place in your Bible. Um, here it is. I found it. As Jesus was traveling, he met ten lepers. Their bodies were covered with sores. The lepers shouted, Jesus, please heal us. Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests. And the ten lepers left. While they were walking away, something amazing happened. All ten of them were healed immediately. Only one man went back to thank Jesus. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and said, thank you. Jesus wondered where the other men were. They did not come back to thank him. So what are, what's something we can take away from today's lesson? What, what have you learned about today's lesson? Anybody? Sing. Sing. Yes, ma'am. Sing. To help one another. To help one another. Anything else? Yes, sir. The Bible. Yes, the Bible. And, and Jesus heals, doesn't he? He heals all of us, even parts of us that people can't see. So... I'm going to ask Josiah to come up here and, and lead the, the prayer, and then we're going to finish up, and I've got a treat for you, okay? Do you care to lead the prayer? Dear God, thank you for this day and all the things we do for this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the church and thank you for you dying on the cross amen amen and thank you Come all on. where are you Jim? Our theme for worship this morning is all about the healing of Jesus. It was a good lesson that Michelle gave us, a reminder. And in our singing today, it is an expression of our thank you to Jesus for all he has done for us. Let us stand and sing number four, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life he that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Please be. 
be seated. Again, with the theme of thanksgiving for all that he has done for us, had it not been the Lord was on our side, where would we be? Had it not been the Lord was on our Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Christ died for us at a time when we were helpless and sinful. No one is really willing to die for an honest person, though someone might be willing to die for a truly good person. But God showed how much he loved us by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. But there's more. Now that God has accepted us because Christ sacrificed his life's blood, we will also be kept safe from God's anger. Even when we were God's enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us. Yet something even greater than friendship is ours. Now we are at peace with God. We will be saved by his son's life. Before I jump into the lesson this morning, I want to reiterate that uh, the last four or five years we've been doing these food boxes, it has been such a blessing. I know you guys don't hear it, but I do. I hear back from the uh, Family Resource Center uh, at the school what a blessing it is. Incidentally, the reason we have family resource officers at the schools in Reedland is because of Terrell. Terrell was involved with the group that originally helped get the family resource officers hired and even paid for, uh, even arranging how they could pay for them. And they do a tremendous work. And they, every year, just are so grateful for what we do. So I encourage you next week, 
bring those groceries. Um, just put them under your seat when you get here. We have a lot of fun letting the kids gather them up. And then in two weeks, plan to stay for a potluck. We have a very special event that day as well. And man, it has just been busy, 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 hasn't it? We're going to have karaoke uh, night coming up at the end of the month. And then I got an email this morning, guys. They've announced that The Chosen is going to be available in the app starting December 11th. So starting after the first of the year, maybe even on the first of the year, TBA, we'll figure that out. We're going to start watching it on Sunday nights here, season three. So if you haven't watched, yeah, <laughs> if you haven't watched season one or two, you've got a couple weeks to get ahead. And if you're tempted to watch ahead on season three, okay, you can if you want, but we'll start watching it together Sunday nights, probably maybe even as soon as the first. We'll send an email about that. I know that was a favorite for a lot of people. All right, this morning, um, I want to ask you a question this morning. Uh, do you know what it's like? Can you imagine what it's like to be an outcast? And you ask that question immediately. There are certain people in this room who will say, I, I just can't even imagine. There's other people who will say, yeah, I feel like at various times in my life or maybe through my whole life, I've been an outcast. Uh, but let's take it a step further. What about being a nobody? I mean, a nothing. W what if you were just seen as the scum of the earth? What if you were shunned and even spit on, isolated and alone. Even your own friends and family abandoned you and hated you. Can you imagine what that would be like? Well, I want to tell you a story about a guy who probably felt that way. I'd have to imagine. I don't really know him, just know about him. But I think he probably felt that way. And his name was Chuck, Chuck Colson. Now, Chuck Colson was the special counsel to President Richard Nixon. And the special counsel is a very, very high staff appointment of somebody who is kind of a lawyer who advises the president. Uh, he's not the president's lawyer. He doesn't go to court, but he's a lawyer who advises the president on how things will be perceived that he does legally. Can he do that? Can he do that? Should he not do that? And if you know anything about Richard Nixon, you know that he didn't really have good legal counsel because he made a lot of really bad decisions. Well, why? Because this guy, Chuck Colson, told him to. In fact, Slate Magazine said that Chuck Colson was the evil genius in an evil administration. So if you remember Nixon, and, and now some of you, now listen, I wasn't alive when Watergate happened, okay? I wasn't born yet. So I know a lot of us in here you know, for me growing up, Watergate was like, what is that? I don't really understand that. Some of you all remember it very clearly, and others have just heard bits and pieces of it. So let's just make sure we all know what it was. Watergate was when Richard Nixon's administration tried to cover up the fact that they had sent people to break in to the Demo Democratic Convention National Headquarters, which happened to be in a building called the Watergate Building. So that's why it was called Watergate. But they, they wanted to get dirt on their enemies, basically. They, they wanted to get dirt on their political enemies, so they sent people to break into the headquarters, go through the files. They got found out, and then they tried to cover it up. Okay, so really simple explanation. And because of that, President Richard Nixon was impeached and eventually resigned from being president. He actually stepped down from being president because of the charges being leveled against him and his administration for covering this up. So... When that happened, this guy, Chuck Colson, he was the mastermind behind it all. He was, he was considered to be the hat, Richard Nixon's hatchet man, okay? Uh, he was quoted as saying that the reason that he was so valuable to President Nixon is because he was ruthless in all he did. Those were his own words. He said, I'm ruthless in everything I do, and that's why the president values me. Um, he kept lists of the president's enemies. He said... Uh, it was said about him that he was willing, that he had, it was said about him that he had said he would run over his own grandmother for the president, okay? Now, there's some doubt over whether he actually said that, but it was reported at the time that he said he would run over his own grandmother for the president. Uh, he, there was a Vietnam, it wasn't just Watergate either, there was a Vietnam War protest in New York, and he didn't want it to happen. So he arranged with some people in New York to arm construction workers with hard hats and rebar and go attack the college students that were protesting. And they did. They attacked the college students with rebar, which is metal rods. 70 people were injured. 
He instigated that. He caused that. The guy was awful. He even proposed firebombing the Brookings Institute so that Nixon's team could slip in in the chaos of trying to put out the fire and steal records. He was a bad dude. He was a really bad dude. And it all came out, right? He got caught. It all came out. Nixon had a really bad habit of recording every conversation. Probably wasn't a good idea because after the fact, all those tape recordings came out and here you had firsthand evidence that Nixon and Colson and his other advisors were talking about doing all this stuff, right? And so it all came out. He was the first one to go down. He was the first one to be arrested. He was the first one to be charged. He was charged with obstruction of justice and he went to federal prison. And his political allies abandoned him. Nixon didn't pardon him. The national news trashed him. The public hated him and his enemies cheered. So I would say going from being in the seats of power in the White House, advisor to the president, to being in federal prison when everyone has abandoned you and your name is mud, it's about as low as it gets. This guy probably understood what it was like to be an outcast, a nobody, a nothing, a scum of the earth, abandoned by his family and friends, hated by his enemies, as low as it gets. The reason I wanted to tell you about good old Chuck Colson is that is about the closest I could think to a modern day leper. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about leprosy this morning. And there's a, on this next slide, there's an illustration from a medieval Bible of lepers uh, coming to try and be examined by the priest. Because in Leviticus, God gives rules for how to handle this disease known as leprosy. And you've got to remember, these are people who are outcasts, nobodies, nothings, scum of the earth, shunned and spit on, abandoned by all and hated. But to be fair, the rules given Leviticus are restorative rules. The rules given Leviticus are supposed to be designed on how to restore someone to the community. And so these rules in Leviticus, um, in chapters 13 through 15, they refer to a lot of different things that we kind of lump under the term leprosy, funguses, skin rashes, degenerative diseases. Now later in history, a doctor determined that there was a, a bacteria that caused what we now call leprosy. That's actually called Hansen's disease. That's one form of what would have been considered leprosy. So this is an umbrella term in the Bible to cover all kinds of skin rashes and diseases. And when somebody had one of these skin rashes or diseases, which could be very, very communicable, you had to protect the community. I mean, just think back about two years. When we first started gathering back together after the COVID crisis, if somebody had been sitting in this church sweating, you say, are you okay? And they go, yeah, I just have a little fever. <laughs> I mean, how many of you stood next to somebody? Well, how many of you stood six feet from somebody in a grocery store line who went, <clears throat> and you went, <laughs> right? You, you remember, you're like, you, you're not allowed to cough in public anymore thing, right? Like, you remember, okay. When there's a very contagious disease, people want to protect the community, right? And so there were rules put in place that people who had this disease had to leave the community. But what's different, what we find is different in Leviticus, it's different than what we see in other ancient texts, is the rules are designed to say, now when the person thinks it might be getting better, here's how they can be restored. So let's, uh, let's see what this says here. Let's go to Leviticus. And in chapter 13, it says, anyone with a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. So what you didn't know is that that was actually what the CDC said for COVID. You got to cover the lower part of your face and yell, I mean, we still do this, right? We say, oh, we've got to quarantine. You've got to cover. They didn't even know about germs. God says, hey, cover the lower part of your face. You'll figure that one out in a couple thousand years, right? They, 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 wore, un, they wore torn clothes. They, they left their hair down. They were unkept because it was supposed to be assigned the community. Don't come near me, okay? So this is keeping the community safe. Leviticus 15 
You must keep the Israelites separate from things that make them unclean. So they will not die in their uncleanliness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. So you see these instances where it says, if they're unclean, if they have this skin disease, they have to be separated from the people. They have to let people know that they're unclean so that the disease is not communicated. But it goes on to say, if it's getting better, they can go to the priest and the priest can examine them. And it gives them different, you know, if it does this, if the rash is this way or whatever, the priest then can pronounce them clean and they can return to community life. So the rules were actually restorative. But what happens with rules? What do we do with rules, guys? Well, break them. Yeah, well, that's, that wasn't where I was going this morning, but I know where your head is. Yeah, we got a rule breaker right here. No, but that's, with rules, we tend to reinforce them with more rules, Right? So because we know that what we're going to do is we're going to break them. But we tend to hedge around things, right? What did did Satan say? You know, when God told Eve, don't eat the fruit, and Satan says, what did God tell you? Oh, don't even touch it. Don't even go near it, right? We set up more boundary rules and more boundary rules. And that's what the Jews did. And so the boundary rules around leprosy grew. But there was a reason why. Because in their thinking... If you had been struck by God with leprosy, it must have been because of something you did. Now, granted, sickness is because of sin. But not my sickness is because of my sin. Sickness, illness exists in the world. Disease exists in the world because we live in a world that has fallen and the consequences of sin are upon us. So there is a connection, but the people wanted to make the connection personal. You have leprosy because of something you did. We see this in Job. All Job's friends coming to him saying, you did something, you did something, you did something. And so over time, the teaching became more and more, not just unclean, a signal that I have something that can make the community unclean. I have a disease that can spread the community, but unclean came to mean sinful maybe even unredeemable. And so what we have happening is people start saying things like the rabbis start saying, well, well, the first time we see leprosy show up in the biblical text, that's when Miriam gossiped about Moses. Miriam and Aaron didn't like Moses' wife. That's what the Bible says. They didn't like his wife. They didn't like their sister-in-law. So they started grumbling. I think that still happens today. People still grumble about in-laws. Well, they started grumbling about their in-law. They started grumbling about Moses. Guess what? Miriam got leprosy on her hand. When Moses found out, Moses cried out to the Lord on her behalf, and he said, I'll I'll heal her, but she's going to have to go out away from the community and be quarantined for seven days. Maybe they'll give her some time to think about what she's done. And so the rabbis started saying, well, see, leprosy is caused by gossip. If you gossip, so all those lepers out there, they're just gossips. It's their fault. There are still Orthodox Jewish rabbis that teach that today. You know, to me, I kind of, in my mind, this picture of a Jewish mom, you know, saying like my mom used to say, if you keep making that face, your face will freeze that way. Say, you know, a Jewish mom said, if you keep gossiping, you're going to get leprosy. You know, I I don't know. It's still, there are still in Orthodox circles, that's still a teaching today in in some Orthodox Judaism. Leprosy is caused by gossip. They wanted to correlate. We wanted to find the reason. We wanted a cause and effect. Well, the rules got more and more intense. And so by the time of Jesus, the Ascends, which were a group that lived out in the desert, if anyone had leprosy, anybody had any skin disease, they had to leave the community. We have written accounts. We have a scroll called the War Scroll that says anyone with leprosy can't be part of the community. They can't even go fight in a war. They can't live among us. They have to leave. They're sinners. They're unclean. They're dirty. They have to go. By the time of Jesus, we have the Talmud. The Talmud is a collection of writings that were written during the exile. Okay? During the Babylonian exile, all of this writing that was done by rabbis is body of work that's coming forward. A lot of what Jesus says when he says, you've heard it say, but I say, he's actually quoting these rabbinic teachings, which we now call the Talmud. In the Talmud, we have all kinds of writings and stories about rabbis who would forbid anyone from walking within 150 feet of a leper if you were downwind of them. If you were downwind, you couldn't even be within 150 feet of a leper. 
They said you couldn't eat any eggs that came out of the region around where a leper lived. They would say that if a ra- they, there were rabbis that encouraged people that if you saw a leper, it is your duty as a good citizen to throw stones at them, to tell them to get away, get away, stop contaminating. You're supposed to jeer them and throw stones at them to remind them that they have to stay away from the community. And so it went from being a disease that God provided a way for there to be restoration in the community to becoming a scourge that has to be separated and pushed out and be afraid of and no one can touch and they can never be restored. And by the time of Jesus, that's the way the people felt about it. So now we have a story in Luke chapter 5 of a leper. A leper who has had to leave his family life Maybe leave his mother and dad's house. Maybe leave his wife. Maybe leave his children and go off and live outside of the community where he can't work, but he can't beg. So he has to scavenge for food or maybe try and find some little plot of land to try and farm, but he's getting run off and moved from place to place. The only other people he can be around are other lepers. He has to yell he's unclean. He's not allowed to be part of of anything. He's not been touched in years. And then he's hurting and aching and suffering with his sickness. And in Luke 5, 12, this is what happens. I noticed something crazy when I was reading this passage a few years back. Well, Jesus was in one of the towns. A man came along who was covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't go tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Follow the law of restoration. Here's what's crazy. It's not that Jesus touched him, okay? Jesus does stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's a lot. You probably heard sermons before. Jesus touched the leper. Jesus reached out and touched the leper. No one had touched this man. That is just Jesus. He's just compassionate. What's crazy is the very first verse in, well, Jesus was in one of the towns. He's in town. And the leper approached him. What does that mean? The leper's breaking the law. He's not allowed in town. It actually says in Leviticus that he's not allowed in the town. He has to leave the community. And then the rabbis have built and built and built upon this. You can't even be within 150 feet. People should be throwing stones. You can't. It is illegal for the leper to be in the town. Now, I just want to put you in the shoes of Jesus for a minute. Forget that you know how the story ends. Forget that you know that Jesus is going to do the right thing. You're a rabbi. You're a teacher of Israel. You are the son of God who wrote the law. There's an obligation to meet here. Jesus would have been completely justified in saying, how dare you? come into this town. Even if I would have, even if I wanted to meet you out in a, in a, in a place far away in the wilderness where no one's around to heal you, how dare you come into the town and put all of these people at risk? How dare you break the law? Do you not care about the law? You want to be healed. You don't care about God. Jesus would have been justified throwing rocks at the man, jeering at him. And Jesus does none of that. He meets the man right in the middle of his lawlessness, right at the moment of his law breaking. Man, how much do we go to God later? Get a little time and distance. Oh, I sinned, God, but um, that was five days ago. Amen. Amen. It was five days ago. I- I've been doing really good, God. Now I can come approach you. We don't want God to meet us in the middle of our lawlessness, in the moment of our sin. This man did not become a leper because of his sin. But make no question, he broke the law seeking to be healed. And in a Jewish understanding, that was clearly 
sin. And Jesus met him in that moment, in that place. Despite the obligations, despite the expectations, despite the criticism he knew would come, when Jesus reached out and touched the man, he actually did something else. Jesus joined him in his uncleanliness. If you touch a leper, you are unclean. Jesus didn't stand at a distance and watch and say, I'll heal you from over here. He joined the man in his uncleanness, in his law-breaking, and cleansed him. And Jesus didn't sin. Jesus reached in and broke the grip of sin. He broke the grip of Satan. He broke the grip of disease. He broke the grip of death in the middle of town. I read that a couple years ago, and I just was sitting there blown away. Blown away. Because this is an example of what we see in Romans 5. Now, we read it just a minute ago, but let's read it again. This is what Romans 5 says. But God demonstrates... His own love for us in this. We've got, we can put it on screen. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think sometimes after years of being Christians and walking around doing this Jesus thing, reading our Bible, going to church, oh God, I messed up, please forgive me. We forget, we forget that God came to earth but not just earth, that he came to our lives, that he got in the pig pen with us, that he got in the slop and the mess with us, that he got in the filth with us, and he sat down and he reached in and he touched us in the middle of our law breaking. The, the gospel story is not, and the people said, God, we need to be forgiven. We will stop sinning. And then Jesus came and forgave them. The story of the gospel is the people said, forget you, God. I don't care about you, God. I don't need you, God. And then Jesus showed up and we said, I need you, God. And he met us in our lawlessness and our brokenness. And by his glory, we saw his grace. Maybe you've been there. I have. I don't know what this guy did next. I mean, did he follow Jesus around because he just couldn't get enough of him? Did he run home and pick up his children that he hadn't held in years and hug them? Did he go to the temple and offer the sacrifices immediately and dance all through Jerusalem saying, I used to be a leper, but now I'm clean. I don't know what he did next. But I know he was restored. Restored to community, restored to health, restored to family, restored to life. Have you been restored? How does it feel to go from scum of the earth, outcast, sinner, villain, contagious, to a person with a whole body, the recipient of a miracle, who's able for the first time to go home to his family? We might should ask Chuck. You remember my friend Chuck? You see, as Chuck was being tried and sentenced for his crimes, a friend of his handed him a copy of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. He read it. And in the middle of his lawlessness, in the middle of his brokenness, in the middle of everyone hating him, he found someone who loved him. He encountered Jesus Christ. And he was overcome by this man named Jesus. And he gave him his life. Now, as he fell to Jesus' feet in the middle of his lawlessness, you could say, hey, listen, Brian, this happens a lot. Criminals find religion, right? I mean, they feel bad about what they did, makes them feel a little bit better. They get a lighter sentence. They get out earlier. It's really common. Well, you would be wrong. About Chuck. Maybe you're right about somebody else, but you'd be wrong about Chuck because this was a total transformation of this man's life. After he got out of prison, he founded the Prison Fellowship International, which for over 40 years has offered Bible studies to prisoners, to people forgotten by society like he was. 
It's given assistance to their spouses and to their children back home. It started a program called Restorative Justice, which works worldwide to help right the wrongs that crime has caused. In fact, after the genocide in Rwanda, Rwanda government was trying to struggle with what they should do to prosecute tens of thousands of people who had committed hate crimes, racially motivated crimes during the war. Prison Fellowship International came in and proposed they use their sycamore tree approach for restorative justice in which people, if they would, come forward in the courts and confess to their crimes face-to-face with their victims they could be restored to society without the threat of imprisonment. Over 10,000 Rwandan people came to court, looked their victims in the eyes, confessed their crimes, and asked for forgiveness as part of the restorative justice program. Similarly, this program was used at the end of apartheid in South Africa. He spent the rest of his life dedicated to undoing the damage that crime does to criminals, their families, and their victims. Prison Fellowship International exists in 112 countries. As part of this ministry, Colson founded a radio ministry called Breakpoint. My guess is you've probably heard it because it's on 1,400 stations and has been for 30 years. I've heard it. I had no idea what it was. This is Chuck Colson with Breakpoint. He has led the charge in restoring relationships between Protestants and Catholics. Before he died in 2012, he was awarded 15 honorate doctorate degrees and the Templeton Prize for Religion, which is the highest prize given for changing the world for the better for religion in the world. But the best, the full circle moment must have come in 2008. This is a picture a man who was led out of the Oval Office in shame, who was handcuffed and imprisoned for the work that he did there, was invited back there in 2008 to receive the Presidential Citizens Medal from George W. Bush for his work in changing the lives of prisoners. Colson's not here anymore. He died in 2012. But I'm going to bet that moment felt a lot like a miraculous healing. To go from the scum of the earth, the worst of the worst, an outcast, a leper. Somebody being recognized for the restorative work that they'd done. This nameless leper in Luke chapter 5 and Nixon's hatchet man in the Oval Office, uh, for very different reasons, found themselves to be social outcasts. One got a disease, the other was a disease. But they both were nobodies, nothings, scum of the earth, shunned, spit on, isolated alone, abandoned by friends, abandoned by family, and hated by all. Lepers caught red-handed in the middle of their unclean lawlessness. And that's where Christ met them. Isn't that just like Jesus? When he met them, they were alone. When he met them, they were unclean. And when he met them, they were lawbreakers. But when he met them, they ceased to be alone, they ceased to be unclean, and they ceased to be lawbreakers. How about you? I don't mean the general you. I don't mean you all. I mean you. You. In your heart, in your spirit, in your soul, deep down in the place where nobody really knows you, not even your wife, not even your dad, not even your mom, not even your best friend, the place that you're afraid, if anybody really knew you, they wouldn't love you. The part of you that says, I don't even want God to know what's going on in there. I'm probably just destined for hell because God couldn't possibly love me because at my core, at my heart, I am lawless. I'm in rebellion to God. I've done stuff I'm ashamed of. I've hurt people that I didn't want to hurt. I've done things that I shouldn't be forgiven of. And in that place where you Settle in the darkness of the night when you wake up and you think, how could I possibly be loved? Christ is there meeting you in your lawlessness. 
cleansing you from your uncleanness, restoring you to relationship and community. Be restored. Be restored. Stop seeing yourself as a lawbreaker, as a leper, as an unclean man or woman, and be restored because Christ met you there. You don't have to clean it up before he loves you. He loves you. And he's already cleaning it up. He won't run from you. He won't throw rocks at you. He won't jeer at you. Jesus will reach out and he'll touch you and he'll say, I am willing. Be clean. Let's sing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this church. Thank you for these families here. Thank you for allowing, allowing my family to, to be here, Father. Father, please uh, be with our sick. Be with those that are not able to be with us today. Please watch over them. Be with those that are got upcoming appointments. Let's let them have news that they, they need to hear. The, the comforting news, the good news, and the, the healing news, Father. Father, continue to watch over each and every one of us. Thank you for our jobs. We're, we're all very blessed. Um, next week, we've got an opportunity to, to help our community. Let us, let us do that with an open heart. Let us uh, be willing to give. Father, as, as we leave here today, Please help us be safe and bring us back to the next appointed time. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Let's stand again. I want us to stand as we sing uh, Psalm 34, Taste and See. It's a beautiful song, a celebration of what God has done in our lives. I sought the Lord and answered me. celebration of all that God has done in our lives and now as we prepare for communion the Lord's Supper let's sing wonderful merciful Savior again all that he has done in our lives wonderful merciful Savior precious Redeemer and friend
John 3, 16. Would you read this with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I entered here this morning, and so did you, a story within a story. My story within his story. Your story within his story. And he said, for God who so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. That whoever believes in that son shall not perish but have eternal life. And he says, remember, remember, do this in remembrance of me. Created in God's image. Love given. Grace given. By God who meets us, met us right where we were. And that means to me, Glenn, in my sinfulness. He didn't meet me at the peak of the mountain when I was the best. He met me in my sinfulness. Grace given, love given. John 13, 34. Read it with me. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I loved you, so you must love one another. Do this in remembrance of me is more than what he did on the cross. He extended that now to me. For the, as I was created to be. To give love as he gave me love. To give grace as he gave me grace. Glenn, my story within Jesus' story is to show you love and grace. Your story within his story, if you remember what he did for you, is to show me love and grace. The extension of what he did, remembrance of me. In the last verses, 1 John 4, 9 through 11. This is how, we, how God showed his love. Among us. He set his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. My interpretation. He might live through us. This is love. Not that we love God. But that he loved us and set his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Hey, Glenn, you're not God. Give up, give up yourself. Surrender to the love and grace you received and show the same love and grace toward Andy or toward Jeff or toward Ben or toward Aaron or Rob or toward even Gene. And you guys do the same with one another. Another verse says, and this is how you will be known as my disciples. He extended his love and grace to us. We remember him, not only in taking the bread, which we'll now take, and the cup, but we do this also by being known as his disciples, doing it with one another. Or in Acts 2, 42 through 47, it says, By this they were added to their numbers daily. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, as we take this bread that resembles or is meant to be a symbol of your body, we break the bread. We take the bread that says to us what you did for us, your love and your grace, for those created in your image to restore, to restore, to reconcile us with you, Father. 
with you, God, through Jesus Christ, his broken body. And as we take the cup, it's a symbol of your blood that was shed for us. We remember again the love and the grace that you extended to us. May your spirit be on me and be on us to extend that same love and grace to one another. So this, by this, they will know we are your disciples. May we remember and be in Jesus' name. Amen. What an amazing grace that God has shed in us that we might be his children and we've been changed because of him yesterday I ran into somebody I hadn't seen in a long time in the grocery store it was a man I had first seen is in a prison in our prison ministry we had at Benton years and years ago now the one thing I learned in prison while I was ministering there is there are no guilty people in prison. They are all innocent and the victim of other people. Except James. James said, I messed up. I was stupid. He paid his penalty. He came out. And he has made something of his life in Mayfield. very very proud of him and what God is doing in his life God can take each one of us in the same way however bad we have messed up we don't come to Jesus when we've got it all together we come to Jesus to get it together and he helps us by his grace let us share the good news that is part of the good news the gospel let's share that as we leave this place Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your amazing grace that you have showered down upon us in the giving of your Son. And we pray, Father, just as Glenn shared just moments ago, that we might be agents of your grace to extend that mercy to the people around us. Help us to show the love and the grace that we see in Jesus, Father, to truly be his disciples as we go out into the world. Bless us as we leave this place, and may we be a blessing to the people around us, Father, as we spread the good news of what Jesus can do in all of our lives. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.